Hey guys, it's MJ, the student's actuary, and we're going to be looking at chapter 14, which is term structure of interest rates for subject CT1. Uh, my voice is a little bit different because I am a little bit sick, so if I do cough uh, randomly during this video, I do apologize. Um, for this chapter, I'm going to split it into two videos. I'm going to look at these interest rate things in this video, and then we're going to look at that whole immunization theory in the second video. And that's just so that one video isn't too long and it doesn't take forever for me to upload it onto YouTube. So without further ado, um, let's jump into the material. And you're going to see on the screen here, we've got something called a discrete spot rate of interest and a discrete forward rate of interest. So these are the two things we're going to look at now. And... Um, I mean, even before we read the definitions or anything, you'll notice that the formulas are very similar except for one difference, and that is your discrete forward rate um, has got this extra time dimension over there. So, but before we get into the maths, let's just talk about them. What is a spot rate of interest? Um, a spot rate is very much, um, it's something on the spot, so... You just use the word spot it's like you go into the bank you say hey I need a hundred rand or a hundred dollars um, what interest rate will you give me today and they will say okay we'll give you 10% interest rate um, here's the money pay us back at the end of n years and so that you can see is kind of what the definition is yn is the yield on a unit zero coupon bond with n years so you take your bond, uh, your $100 from the bank, and after a certain time period, you pay them back uh, that amount with the interest. And so what we can do is we started with uh, the amount that they gave us, but let's say we had to pay them back 110 We can use this to discount to see the amount at time zero. Uh, so very simple, very straightforward. It's the main type of interest rate people used before they became financially sophisticated so you go somewhere whenever you make a transaction and you agree on an interest rate on the spot that is the spot rate of interest very simple it only has the duration dimension then you have something known as the discrete forward rate of interest <coughs> and sorry <coughs> The discrete forward rates of interest is the annual rate of interest agreed at time zero for an investment made at time t for a period of r years. So what that kind of is, in our example, you go into the bank and you say, look, it's my son's birthday in six months time and I want to take him on a fancy holiday. I would like to borrow 100 um $100 now for his holiday, but I only want to take that money out in six months' time. Um, what interest rate will you give me in six months' time? And the reason why you will do this is because you're unsure on how interest rates might vary in the future and you want to lock in your price now. So what you're doing, in a sense, is you're kind of making a bet on the interest rate. If the interest rates go up, and you'd have to pay more um, to service your, your loan, then by taking this forward rate, you would have effectively earned money. But if you, the interest rates come down and you would have had to have paid less, then you would have lost money. But you will have removed that risk of a varying interest rate so you can almost plan for your holiday now, knowing with certainty what your interest repayments are going to be. So that's discrete spot rate is when you get it immediately discrete forward rate is when you're going to take out a loan sometime in the future and you want to lock in the interest rate now. So let's look at a very quick example to see how the two of these guys link up with each other. So my example is very simple. I have two bonds, okay? The one, um, well, the, yeah, they got 5% coupons um, paid annually in arrears they are redeemable at par, and the red dates are one year and two year, 
and the price of each is 96 per 100 nominal. Now you might, should be understanding um, all this bond jargon, um, so let's move straight on to the mathematics. So you can see in our first bond, um, what we're going to do is, <coughs> sorry, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to draw out our timelines, which I've done here. I've drawn out two timelines. Um, you can see the one is from time zero to time one, and the other is from time zero to time two. The one has a duration of one year, and the other has a um, duration of two years. So when I mean red date, I mean the redemption date, the date that the bond ends and you have to repay it. So now what we're going to calculate is we're going to calculate the spot rate um, for one year, and we're going to calculate the forward rate for one year in one year's time. So in order to calculate the spot rate, we're using very simple mathematics. We're saying uh, at time zero, we can get 96 by discounting the redemption amount by this interest rate because it's the only interest rate. Take it back one year and we get 9.375%. Fantastic. Um, we need to do this in order to calculate our forward rate because now with the second bond, what is going to be this forward or this future interest rate? What we do is we break it up into um, two parts. And what we're going to see is um, there's a 5% coupon over here. Uh, remember, this guy, he paid it at the final amount, so that's why it was 100 plus the 5, but here we got the 5 and then 105, so we've got two cash flows. Mm -hmm. So for the second bond, we have um, our 5 over here, that's going to be discounted by the spot rate of Y1, and we've got this other amount, and this is where a lot of people make mistakes, is they'll take this blue forward rate and they'll discount it by 2 years, and that's wrong, you can't do that. You need to discount it back to 1 year, because the interest rate changes and then discount it back. So you can see I've got it over here. One year is I'm going to be discounting by the spot rate, and one year I'm going to be discounting by the future or forward rate. I do this calculation because I've worked out the bond, uh, the spot rate in the first bond, I can calculate the second one. Now I might say to you, <coughs> this is all cool and everything. But um, what else can we can we do with these spots and these forward rates? Um, I mean, one of the typical questions is, instead of taking a forward rate, what would be the overall spot rate? So a spot rate of duration 2. And I've got kind of something similar in this next example. So what we've got here is we want to calculate what the 6-year spot rate is. So this is a different uh, question, a different example. Uh, we want to calculate what the six-year spot rate is. We know what the two-year spot rate is, and we know what the, the two-year forward rate is with a, a four-year duration. And as we can see from this formula, and that's why I want to show this to you guys, is how nice it is. So to get your spot rate from zero to six, you first calculate the interest component from zero to two, and then you're going to multiply that by the future rate, 2 to 6. And this value here, or this little equation here, is what was taking place over here. And you can see, at first you would read this question and you'll be like, whoa, what's going on? There's all these different interest rates, there's all the different duration, there's all these different numbers, it's all very confusing. But if you draw out a timeline, and I know I say this in every video, to draw out the timeline, if you draw out the timeline, you can see exactly what interest rate is happening at what time and which one is a component of which other ones. And then this should become very, very easy. Now to understand why um, we would make future interest rate contracts and various things like this is that we need to understand that interest rates change. And the reason they change is because if you actually come down to think about it, interest rates are made up. They're made up by the central uh, banks around the world. 
Um, I mean, now in, in England, they're having a discussion, like, should we raise the interest rates? Um, they want to do that to try to combat um, some of their own economical um, conditions happening there in London and in England. But they're very scared to raise interest rates because of what's happening in China. So you can see it's a very delicate decision. They don't just suck their thumb and be like, oh, let's make interest rates 10% today. It's a very delicate um, procedure because your interest rates have repercussions on your entire economy. And the reason being is we're going to look now at four different theories that try and explain how interest rates work. But please remember that all of these are just theories. And at the end of the day, interest rates are just made up. So <laughs> let's, let's have a look at them. So there's four um, theories. And it's nice and easy to remember them because they spell the word lime. Um, that's like a lemon thing. L-I-M-E. Expectation theory is the most important one. <coughs> but we'll get to that one last. Okay, the first is liquidity preference. And this one makes a lot of sense. What it says, people like to have a, a, a liquid asset. And the longer an asset is, so the, the less liquid it is. And what I mean by that is, if you make two loans to two individuals, the one loan um, they have to repay you at the end of the week, the other they have to repay you at the end of the year. The very first one is much more liquid in the sense that after one week, you're going to get your money back. It's going to be converted back to cash. Cash is liquidity. Whereas with your other um, asset, it's going to take an entire year before that turns back into liquidity. So what we do is with these two loans and let's say they're identical people they're twins with the same risk profile you're going to be charging the person um, who takes it for a week a much lower annual interest rate than the person who takes it out for an entire year and this is just to compensate you um, for the higher risk that the person there's a higher chance that they'll default but just that higher um, chance that you don't actually have access to that money and there's this whole thing that um, that long dated bond that you've made to that person if you want to sell out to somebody else so if you ever do want to convert it to cash it's very um, how would you say it's very vulnerable or sensitive to future interest rates because if you lend it to them at 10 percent and then interest rates um, skyrocket to 20 percent you have to convert or sell that bond at half the price, well, around half the price in order to get out of that position. So, whereas with the guy with one week, if interest rates do do that, you just wait the one week duration out rather than lose half of your money. So, liquidity preference, and you can see by the graph here, is the light blue one. And that's saying that as term increases, interest rates should increase. So, that's the little blue one. Let's look now at the red line, which is kind of saying the exact same thing. Except in this case, it's talking about inflation. And they're saying that the longer a bond is issued, the more exposure it has to inflation, which can deteriorate its real value. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're in a climate where inflation is very high. And you lend someone 100 bucks today, and at the end of the year, they have to pay you back 110. But in that time, inflation has it's gone like Zimbabwe and the currency value is devalued by half. This person could have taken your money, bought gold or bought a car, driven this car around for a year, sold this car for just a little bit less, but because, well, would actually have sold it for more because of the inflation and easily paid back your loan and actually have made money in that sense. So that's an extreme case, but this is why um, with regards to inflation, the, the longer the term is, the more exposed you are to inflation, and therefore you need a higher interest rate to compensate you for taking this extra risk. So you can see that is the red line over there. The final, well, sorry, not the final one, the final, well, the penultimate one before you get to expectation theory is this thing known as market segmentation. And this one makes, also, they, that's what I like about these things. They all make logical sense. 
Market segmentation says forget liquidity preference, forget inflation. Um, supply and demand determine the price of interest rates. So if you have a lot of um, players in the financial market demanding short-term interest rates or demanding short-term um, assets, then those interest rates are going to be, are they going to be high or they're going to be low if you have a strong uh, demand for them? And the answer is the demand will be, I mean, the interest rate will be quite low. Um, if you have hardly any demand, then in order to entice investors, the interest rate will have to increase. But what we'll see is that there is a high demand for long dated assets. And the reason being is, we'll see this when we come to immunization in part two of this uh, chapter, is that insurance companies and pension funds and all of this type of stuff, they demand long dated assets in order to match their long dated liabilities. So because there's all this demand over here, it pushes the interest rate down. And because interest rates go down, the price of these bonds increase, whereas the reverse is true over here. However, if more banks and short-term um, financial institutions dominate the market, remember banks would rather have short-term assets in order to cover their uh, deposit liabilities, then we could see this curve change completely. And that's why I've also made the blue line um, like that as well. So with market segmentation, your line can fluctuate depending on the players in your economical market. Um, let's finally look at expectation theory. And this is attraction varies according to future expected interest rate movements. So, and what this is saying is, how does the market expect interest rates to change in the future? If we expect um, a decrease in short term, um, in short term assets, then they become less attractive and so the yields will rise. So you can see, even though this is the dominant theory, um, it's also the most vague. Like, what does expectation mean? So this almost takes into consideration all these other factors and builds it into this theory. So if we expect interest rates to rise, we're going to do uh, this and that, and it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's probably the hardest one, and probably the one I would tell you to go research a little bit further after this video if you're still having difficulty with it. So read something on Investopedia or something like that on expectation theory. I want to move on quickly to gross redemption yields and par yields and then um, yeah, just wrap up this video. So very quickly, gross redemption yields. This is the effective interest rate that satisfies the equation of value for a bond. So this is, at the end of the day, taking in coupons, taking in redemption amounts, what is the redemption yield that you're actually going to be getting? And you can see it is very, very easy because what you do is you just create an equation of value and you can work it out. But remember, these are yellow spot rates. So what you need to do first is calculate um, them independently. So what you do here, <coughs> oh sorry, what you do first is you use these gross redemption, sorry, you use these spot yields to calculate the price of the bond that someone will pay. So um, the first spot yield is 7%, the next is 6 and 3 quarters, the final one is 6 um, and 1 quarter. And you can see this is a decreasing um, yield curve. Uh, that's what we've just discussed over there. So it will be almost that green one over there. But anyway, coming back to this question, what we first do is we use our spot um, rates with our coupons and our redemption amounts to calculate our price. Once we get the price that we actually pay for this bond, we then set up an equation of value. And we say, we're going to pay 96,60. We're going to be receiving uh, three coupons plus the redemption amount. If we had to turn these spot rates into a single interest rate uh, so that we have a, it's more of a summary measure, what is that amount? So you can't, if someone says, oh, what's your return on this bond? You can't say, oh, I'm getting 7% this year, 6 and 3 quarters this year, and 6 and 1 quarter the final year. 
that's a little bit too confusing. You calculate this gross redemption yield. It's like a summary and you're going to have to use interpolation to calculate this and you're going to get to a value 6.28%, which is interesting, um, not just because it's an interest rate, but because we can see that as a value, it sits between these two over here. Now, I've just said it's an average, so you would expect it to be maybe somewhere more here or over here. But remember, this value here, this 100, has got much more weight um, on it because all the others have just got weights of 5 and 5. And the final one has 105. And so because of such a heavy weight like that, um, you can see it, it almost dominates the gross redemption yield. Because that converter is actually 6.25. And these guys have just had a very small effect by making a 6.28. So they've just increased ever so slightly. So that's a quick little test you can do in the exam to make sure that your gross redemption yield um, is correct by looking and making sure it makes sense. Also with interpolation, it's a very great way to start because remember you have to guess your initial amounts. So look at what interest rate dominates the equation and put your amount first there. And here we know it would be a value greater than uh, six and a quarter, but not by much because of the heavy weighting. Finally, um, yeah, let's look at the par yield and we will close this video up. So par yield, it's the annual coupon rate such that the bond is redeemed at par. So it's very simple to calculate. What you say is, what is the coupon that I need to get if I am going to redeem the bond at a par value. So I'm going to invest 100 Rand, I want 100 Rand back after N years, and I only want to be compensated through a coupon. And you might want this, um, this type of remuneration in the sense that it might be tax effective, uh, because remember coupons will get income tax and redemption could get capital tax, although in different markets they have different rules. Um, but here we go. So Coupon bias is the difference between the N-year par yield and the spot rate. So that is, yeah, that's the coupon bias. So let's do a quick little example um, <clears throat> to see what's going on here. So what we do is we calculate um, our coupon value is 6.4. Um, so the par yield is 6.4%. And how we did this is we used the future values. Um, to calculate it, actually we don't use the future values, that's wrong. What we do is we use the spot rates. And what we and that's, so, that's where they might make this question a little bit tricky, is you need spot rates in order to calculate um, your, your par yield or your, your coupons, um, but they give you future rates. So what you first have to do is calculate your spot rates. The first spot rate is very easy because it's the same as the future uh, one there, they've given it to you. The second one's also quite easy because they've given it to you as well. But the third one, 6.4%, you see you actually have to work it out. Um, so that's where they can make these questions a little bit tricky, but if you understand how spot and forward and all these things work together, you can see that it's actually a very easy part of the course and that you're going to be picking up these marks very easily. So yeah, that's all I'm going to talk about in this video. The next one, we are going to talk about uh, discounted mean term, um, modified duration, uh, convexity, Reddington's conditions for immunization, and we're going to go through an example. And then yeah, there's chapter 15 on stochastic interest rate models, which I am also getting around to making. So yeah, thanks guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Cheers.